This episode is brought to you by Zencaster. Zencaster is the number one tool for all podcasters. You can record high fidelity audio between remote locations and get studio quality sound. Go to Zencaster.com and use coupon code that entertains for 20% off for three months or 20% off an annual plan. Everything is awesome is part of Courts and Parts, a podcast network featuring pop culture, TV, movie, and geek podcasts. Check out some of our other shows like TV Ate My Brain, Let's Chat with Revelant Friends, and Podstalgic at courtsandparts.com. Welcome to this week's edition of Everything is Awesome. I am your host, Kev, and this is the show where we sit down and talk to awesome people about awesome things. That's right, and uh, we are continuing our celebration of the Philadelphia Podcast Festival. We are just mere days away from the conclusion weekend of the festival. What I love about the Philadelphia Podcast Festival is that it is two weekends that bleeds a little bit into the week as well of mostly free podcasting there's some bigger acts that come through town as well that come to the uh, fit philly improv theater the trocadero and some other venues where there's a small cost involved but you get to see philadelphia based podcasting at tattooed moms amalgam comics and coffee house red caps and other venues for free uh both weekends and this weekend is tattooed mom heavy uh, I believe there's some. Uh, the track is also having some shows, but if you need some free entertainment this weekend, I suggest going to Tattooed Moms. You can go to phillypodfest.com/schedule for the complete schedule. But like my guest this week, he'll, who is performing on July 1st at 3 p.m. That's Greg Holdsman with Philly Famous. I will be performing July 1st at 1 p.m. We are opening up. We are kicking off the last day of the festival uh, at Tattooed Moms. It's going to be a fun time. We've already announced that we're playing a game, giving away awesome prizes. Food Fright, where we have four food challenges, and you can win cash. A gift card to Tattooed Moms, and a gift card to Mind Escape, and some other awesome prizes. But I'm going to sweeten the pot a little bit with our guest announcements. Again, with our guest announcements, we already, get, we already announced... We already announced Kyle Harris. He'll be there to perform some stand-up and chat comedy with us. But we also have Jacqueline Holloway. That's right. She is a fight choreographer and stunt worker here in Philadelphia, and she's going to come by to talk about the work she's done, what she does with her classes and workshops, and maybe even demonstrate some stuff that you see done on TV, film, and the stage. Very excited for our show this weekend. Be there July 1st at 1 p.m. Uh, and stay the whole day. I'll be there all day helping, volunteering my time to make sure things go smoothly. It's going to be a fun, fun, fun time. Uh, after Us is Full Belly Laughs, which is one of the, a, a definitely top three performance that I love to see in the city uh, when, when they're doing their show live. So make sure you check that out. Uh, Philly Famous is going to be on as well, and many other great shows. I believe uh, Twisted Philly is closing out t- Tattooed Moms. Uh, on July 1st and, and officially ending the 2018 Philadelphia Podcast Festival. So come out for a great day of podcasting. Uh, make sure you buckle up because this is going to be a fun conversation that I have with Mr. Greg Holdsman, who is the host of Philly Famous. His show is an interview style show, a lot like uh, Everything is Awesome here, except uh, definitely better researched, better done, and has a very big focus on Philadelphia and the people that come from it. So uh, let's get into that conversation now. Let's talk about Greg and his podcast and how it came about right here on awesomepodcast.com. This is your first, well, I guess maybe we should do a bit of an introduction for the people, uh, even though I'm probably going to cover most of it in my pre-intro. But uh, Greg, you are the, the, the host of Philly Famous. Uh, go tell us about the podcast. Yeah, you want me to first start with with how it came to be, or really the essence of what it is. Give me the essence of what it is, and then we'll get to the origin point uh, in a little bit. 
Gotcha. Yeah. So what I do is I interview people that either live in Philly or that are from Philly that have either already made a name for themselves in any area of life, really, whether that be sports, music, TV, music, medicine, business, whatever, um, or people that are around my age. I'm, I'm a college student. So people in their early 20s uh, that are currently trying to make a name for themselves as either entrepreneurs or up and coming artists and musicians. Um, and I call those plug it editions where I'm trying to plug somebody's work. Um, but my more traditional episodes are with, you know, more established people that are, are more well known throughout Philadelphia for their work. Okay, and and so uh, you are. A lot of people attribute this show to, and I and I I try to correct them when I can, but they say, "Oh yeah, everything is awesome." Is that like Philadelphia interview show? I'm like, well, I mean, I'm based out outside of Philly, but like we don't like I. I I don't talk to just Philadelphians and I've kicked around the idea of like kind of converting it to be very local like that. Uh, but there's just, there's for me, like there's just a lot of interesting people that, that like this show can cover outside of the Philly area uh, and, and whatnot. So you sound like you're doing like the real, and I love that there's, I love the locality shows. Like there's a plenty, like um, uh, I don't know if you've ever listened to 25 o'clock pod, uh, by Dan Drago. Haven't heard of him. But he he does uh like his is like Philly based music basically. Uh and and to me they're actually way more interesting like to listen to because it is it is like the hometown, you know? Um so you're doing exactly what uh I've been attributed to in, in the past and uh I like that. It's it's a it's a good way to uh to stand out. But I do I, and I'm sure you you had to think you had to at one point thought about spelling it this way, uh, did you just not go with PH and famous because it was too obvious? It's too cheesy, too obvious. Okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so I, I, a lot of people have brought that up to me, and um, yeah, I, mean, I, I think I've seen like a Philly famous cheesesteak spot with that spell. Yes. Um. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to take that. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. I guess to, to make it a little bit more unique. That's that's true. Yeah, because I if it, me I and maybe it's I'm, so I'm a I, I'm probably about a decade older than you. I'm in, I'm in my early thirties, uh, and I guess uh, my generation definitely would have gone for sure with that PH in famous. <laughs> uh, so it's good to see that the, the that you guys are growing up a little bit. Uh, so yeah, give me the origin story about you know where like at what point. Did you think of doing a podcast? Because I mean, really, if you are college age, early twenties, you know, you you've been you're, you're only like double the age of a podcast. Podcasts have been around for almost half your life at this point. So, w- what what was it that made you want to do a podcast? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the story starts. I, I have to start it, I guess, back in high school. Um, I, I was a lifelong athlete, and I was a big time. Uh, basketball player in high school, and I, I went to play basketball uh, at a small school in, in Granville, Ohio, called Denison, uh, to play college basketball. And in my first year and a half, I got three concussions oh, wow. that uh, ended my playing career um, and led to really, really lengthy recoveries um, with pretty intense symptoms. And during my recoveries, I couldn't watch TV, I couldn't exercise, I couldn't do homework. All I was doing was laying in bed listening to podcasts, and that was my introduction to, to I guess, you know, the magic and the intrigue uh, that podcasts are. Um, and so what happened was after my third concussion, after my sophomore year, uh, I was finishing my, my recovery, and I decided that I was going to end my playing career, and I was going to transfer home to Temple uh, to finish my recovery and to finish my education. And this past Late October, early November is when I decided to start my own. Uh, I needed to do something with my time. I still couldn't really exercise, um, and I was really just doing school, so I had some time on my hands. Um, and I'm passionate about Philly. Uh, I'm passionate about you know young creatives, innovators, um, and you know I started with a lot of sports guests, but that's really you know how I started my own, um, and that's how I came up with the name Philly Famous mm-hmm. uh, when I was when I was out in Ohio at, at school. I really miss the city. I really miss Philly. Um, so I, I figured, you know, what better way to, to represent that but by calling my, my podcast Philly Famous. So now did you start it while you were still out in Ohio or, or when you officially were here in Philly? 
No, I started this past this past year when I was in Philly, my, okay. my first semester at Temple uh, in my junior year. Okay. Uh, and, uh, man, it blows my mind to – because so I've been – You've been doing it for, you know, what, maybe eight months at this point. Uh, I I started uh, in 2007 is when I started, not this show, but podcasting in general, back when like the term podcast was maybe a year old. Uh, and uh, and like, I'm, so, so 07, you're, how old are you at that point? 07, I would have been 11. Wow. So that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So podcasting has literally been around for, for half your life. It, how was it so like growing up at that age? Cause when in 2007, I was, oh, that's 11 years ago. I was like 30, I was like 22. I was your, probably your age now. Uh, so, so for me, you know, I, the only reason I really discovered it was because of Kevin Smith um, and, and being a fan of his and then him starting his own podcast back in 07. Uh, other than that, I'm more of a traditional radio guy. Like my influences were, uh, to, to like to get into some sort of talky radio thing was like Howard Stern, Kid Chris, uh, Matt and Huggy, like all these like Safer Stern, all these Philly guys that were on ninety four one. What like what was your influence to to you know aside from just like listening to them and you're recovering? Is like there any one podcast or radio personality that that you kind of were influenced by? Yeah, there were a couple. Um, first, first of which I think who I think is credited as really the pioneer of of modern day podcasting is Bill Simmons. Okay. Who are you aware of who he is? No, no, never heard of him. So Bill Simmons, um, people mainly know him, uh, cause he started Grantland, which was a show on ESPN. Um, okay. and since then he, he's left ESPN. He had a show on HBO. And when that ended, he now has started, um, a multimedia company called the ringer, which is actually the publication that broke the Brian Colangelo story. Okay. Uh, um, it's like a sports and pop culture blog and podcast network. Um, and he has his own podcast, which has been around now for, I think around 11 years, actually. Okay. And he actually has a very similar format to mine where, um, you know, he just has on an interesting person and, and they just talk for a while about various topics. Um, there's not necessarily one theme. Um, and then what kind of opened my eyes to the popularity of, pod- of podcasts was, a podcast called Part of My Take, which is um, presented by Barstool Sports. And it's okay. two guys, Big Cat and PFT. And it's really like a satirical sports podcast. Um, it's hilarious. And I think it's the number one sports podcast on iTunes. Um, and it's like really become mainstream pop culture now. Um, and that kind of that kind of was the first one that I realized this can be what everyone listens to. So uh... – you so it, all your stuff it seems like it's very uh, whether you're you're doing it or not you like sports so you, the, the sports um, personalities and and radio personalities influenced you heavily. Yeah, I would say so. And then I, I listened to a couple more, I guess, culture society ones, mm-hmm. some funny ones. One's called the uh, the Great Debates, okay. which I believe are two writers uh, that wrote for the Office, um, and they just like name a topic, and one takes the pro, one takes the con. And, and, you know, it, it's pretty funny, mm-hmm. uh, pretty interesting. And, um, you know, I listen to Tim Ferriss, which I guess is more of a lifestyle one. But I would say on a, on a day-to-day basis, uh, I still probably listen to six to eight podcasts every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of them happen to be from the Ringer Podcast Network because they do, like I said, it's not just sports, it's also pop culture. Okay. Politics. So I listen to one called the Rewatchables, where they break down the most rewatchable movies of all time and spend an hour kind of going through the cast, going through favorite moments, um, and they do a recapables too for TV shows. Uh, and I'm a huge Westworld and Game of Thrones fan, mm-hmm. and they, they they do both of those. Um, so I, I, you know, I think where sports is probably my heaviest influence and probably my my first passion and where I'm most comfortable talking. Uh, during my own podcast and, and, you know, having several interviews with musicians and entrepreneurs and, and artists and, and doctors, I, I've become much more well-versed in other areas of life. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to limit myself to just sports. I want to keep diversifying myself and keep learning and growing in other areas. Yeah. I, that And that, that's when I, um, 
I used to do, and this is the way uh, I, I don't know about other podcasters, but like the, when we first started in 07, uh, we said like, let's just do like a talk show, like, like Matt and Huggy. I, I don't know if you're, you're probably not familiar at all with the free FM years of 94 one. Uh, but when, when Stern first left, 94 one went all talk uh, with David Lee Roth in the mornings I think Barsky uh, was mid mornings, then Kid Chris afternoons, and and Matt and Huggy were somewhere in there as well, and uh, we like that was like the basis of of podcasts, at least in my world, because I listened to for me, I really only like I, I didn't know what a podcast was, like you know ten. 11 years ago. Well, I guess obviously 10 years ago since I've been doing it for 10 and a half years, but 11, 12 years ago, you know, a podcast to me was so, I mean, there weren't many guys doing it and radio stations were doing like, they would upload their stuff and call them a webcast. Uh, so we, yeah, we did, uh, we pigeonholed ourselves into the like shock jockey type of radio shows that I stuck with for like eight years, took a couple years off when I had a kid, uh, and then came back and originally I was going to be the guy who just talked to podcasters, which this with the show is generally I do talk to podcasters, but it felt like same way, like pigeon, pigeonholing yourself into just that one topic, you limited what you could do and, and grow as, as a podcaster. Um, and mm-hmm. so we talked to everybody now. Uh, so when have you done the show live or will the podcast fest be the first time you do it live it will be the first time i'm doing it live and i'm, I'm really excited and uh, it'll be practice for me because next semester uh my first semester senior year at temple i'm going to be hosting my own tv show with a very very similar premise to my podcast except instead of famous philadelphians it's going to be um, prominent temple alumni oh. So it'll be a good chance for me to be in front of people for the first time to uh to feel that out. Nice. That and I and we should mention um I don't know uh if we mentioned it at the top or if it made it into the cut, but uh this interview and this conversation is part of like like my ongoing series that I do every year to help promote the Philadelphia Podcast Fest. Uh, so before we forget, we'll also tag it at the end of the show, but, uh, give a quick plug for when, where, uh, you're doing your, your podcast fest show. Yeah, absolutely. So my show is going to be the last day of the festival on July 1st, Sunday, 3 PM at the tattoo mom bar on South street. Okay. Um, that's my plug. I, it's yet to be determined who my guest is. I'm going to try to make it one of my biggest so far. Um, would appreciate any support. I think it'll be a fun day, a fun show, and um, excited for it. Yeah, the the Philadelphia Podcast Fest. This is our. This will be my third year doing it, um, and it is such a fun time. Tattooed Mom is the place that I I've been at all three years now to to host my show there. Uh, I've done live shows outside of the festival at other venues, but Tattooed Moms. Uh, we're actually so I'll I'll see you uh, and see your show live on that day because everything is awesome is kicking off the last day at the festival um, uh, at, at Tattooed Moms at one p.m. Awesome and. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it is funny how uh, I don't know when so so you don't book live guests uh, obviously until now, but how how do you go about booking guests? Because uh, it's for me still the thing that I hate doing the most all these years later, where I have been a guest driven show even in the shock jockey days, uh, and I am very last minute. Like if I know I need to have a, an episode for next week, it's usually like two days before where I book somebody. And same thing with my live shows. It's like Oh, that's, that's happening in about three weeks. I should probably book somebody. How is it stressful for you? Do you find it stressful? Not, not so far. I mean, I think it's getting harder as I've gotten more guests. Um, Mm -hmm. But it started out me working through my network, my connections to people that I already knew that I already wanted on the podcast early on. Uh, And that was pretty easy to get the first, you know, 10 to 15. After that, it became me reaching out on social media to people that looked really interesting to me on either Instagram or, or Facebook or someone I read about. And I would reach, I would reach out to them through social media, or through email. Um, and then recently what's been really cool to see this uh, transformation is that people have actually been reaching out to me. People that have listened to my episodes, have seen who I interview, um, have said, you know, reach out to me either through email or through, through social media, you know, Hey Greg, I love your show. I, I would love to, to, to be on it and promote, either my brand or, or someone that they know they recommend. So that's been cool to see that, that evolution. That is, and I'll tell you, uh, 
doing everything is awesome for two and a half years now. Uh, it's, it's infrequent, uh, to, to get those people requesting to be on your show. But, uh, when it happens still, like, you know, let's, let's say it happens maybe once a month. Uh, uh, that is still such a good feeling. I remember the first time that it happened for, uh, for me on everything's awesome. It's, it's a, a good like ego booster because it feels like you know what you're doing and, and people respect you. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, no, and, and don't get me wrong. I, my show has a lot of, um, you know, I still have to improve a lot and it, yeah. it's been, this is, this was brand new to me. And I feel like in the last seven, eight months, I have come a long way as, as a host, uh, as a researcher, uh, as an editor, uh, as, as a marketer and brander, but you know, I'm still really in the beginning stages of learning and I, and I have a long way to go and I want to keep adapting and making my show better mm. and better. Well, and I think uh, podcasting is always kind of um, like a, an ever learning thing um, industry. Like you need to kind of, and and I think we're f- kind of at the point where where technology is almost as far as podcasting is concerned. I, I feel like I don't. It's hard to predict what the next best thing is or what what the what we need as podcasters because as, as so like going back ten eleven years ago. Like the way I'm doing an interview right now with you was not possible. Like it, it, my very first episode of a podcast, I was in, we still did it remotely, but I was in Maine for work. My co-host was in Levittown and our producer was in Philadelphia. Uh, for me and my co-host, we just needed a computer with, with, uh, with a microphone, but my producer to have intros and commercials play to have a, a phone line for a guest to call in on. Um, and to have all of us patched in and able to talk to one another involved I th- like six computers, maybe seven, something like that. Um, and, and there's no way that I, that's something you can do rem- like, like me, you and I are talking in the middle of the afternoon when, uh, I normally am, am working, uh, and am working. I'm on my lunch break. So it, it's 10 years ago, maybe even like five years ago, that wasn't a possible thing. Now that podcasting has, and, and maybe uh, you as being the younger generation, and maybe you have your, your finger on the pulse more than I do, uh, I, I don't see it. Do you see, like, as um, you are, you know, you've done just on in-studio stuff right now, but, do, like, what, is there, like, another technology that could help you do this better or easier? Um, I, I mean, I think it's, the, the great thing about this has been, it, it is so easy. I mean, I just, I have to yeah. think- plug it in the computer, sit down with my guest, press record, and let it run. And I really, unless something really, um, you know, someone says something they didn't want to say or or they call for five minutes, which I've had happen before, I don't do a ton of editing. Um, so, you know, the sound quality, I, I guess, could be improved with, with some higher level technology. But beyond that, I mean, the nice thing about this is that it is so easy with, with, with the technology that, that we have. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, I feel like we're finally there. Like, like obviously if, if you're going to go into the video world, the video side of podcasting and video cast, um, there's a lot more things that I think will always improve because they're always finding ways to, to make higher resolution, uh, viewing devices. So there's always, I think going to be a way to improve that, but like the two people sitting around talking or, or a handful of people sitting around talking, that's only like audio is only going to sound so good, no matter how high of a bit rate you have. Like it's, it's all the same at some point, unless you're, you're vocalizing or have instruments involved or something like that. So I feel like we're like at the place where, okay, like now it's just about kind of like podcasting now, which is something that I'm still not fully good at is I think more about marketing and branding than it is about the technology because the technology has now been around for at least five years to, to make it as simple as possible. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, you're showing me through this interview, how easy it is to do this when you're not in person. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's like a learning thing. That's like something that like, it's a, it's a technology that exists that like until last, uh, until two years ago, I didn't know it was this easy to record a, a remote interview. Uh, and it's just something once you know about it, then it opens up for like, now that you know about it, that's going to open up the, the Philadelphia guests that you can have on, whether they are actually in Philly or maybe they relocated, but they're originally from Philly or something like that. Yeah. That being said, there is something to be said about you know, the intimacy you get when you're with somebody recording 
Yeah. Um, and you can kind of read their their raw reactions, their raw emotion. Um, and I, I tend to prefer that, although, you know, there are some guests that I really want that won't be able to come to me. And if I can't come to them, this would be a great option. Yeah. And, I, and as someone who for the last um, probably year and a half has strictly done remotely podcasts uh, because I tore my studio apart and have yet to, to uh, get in there and, and finish building it again. Um, it, it is something that I miss. There is like, there's plenty of guests that I actually like have only that I would have on. I like to have some of my guests be repeat guests uh, just because we have good conversations or maybe, you know, we go instead of doing an interview slash conversation about whatever we, we're actually going to sit down and talk about a movie or review something. Sometimes the show isn't just an interview. Um, and that like, like, I prefer in studio and we haven't, I haven't had those ghost, those guests back on because I need to rebuild my studio. Cause I do, I want that intimate uh, moment. And, and it is something that, uh, that I personally do miss. Um, but that's also like that for me, uh, like the way the Zen, uh, Zencaster works, what we're using to record this has spoiled me in the sense that I get two tracks. I get me, I get you on separate tracks, uh, which isn't something that my home studio gets. Everything records onto one track. So if uh, we talk over each other or I happen to cough while you're talking or vice versa, I can edit out all that stuff and, and make it seem, sound like a clean conversation. Can't do that in my home studio where, you, you know, there's if I cough over you saying something and we don't go back and re-record it, uh, it it's kind of either a ruined moment or a missed moment. No, I, I agree with that. Um, but I think one thing that, that separates uh, podcasting from radio is that I really think people want to hear what's real. So if, 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 if you misspeak or if, if they're, you know, I mean, people don't want to hear coughing, but it, you know, if there's some stuff in the conversation that doesn't sound perfect, that's okay because that's real. And the great thing about yes. podcasting is it's uncensored if you want it to be. Um, and people really like to hear a genuine conversation that they could hear in the, in the street on an, in an everyday day. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. That's like the way I, so, so I, I think we have kind of the same editing mindset just based off that, uh, that little, you know, piece of information you put out there because I, the way I view my shows now, even though I don't stream these live anymore is there was a, there was a, uh, the first eight years of podcasting for six of those years, I probably live streamed everything through this service called stick cam. And uh, because of that, we never edited our episodes because why? Like it's already been viewed by hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people. Uh, and they've heard us stutter. They've heard us misspeak. They've heard us, you know, make mistakes. So we, unless it was literally something that, we would hide the, the 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 streamed recording from from public view because something really bad happened, which I think happened never. Uh, we didn't do any editing. We just all we did was make it sound good and for the audio file and for iTunes and kind of just button it up a little bit versus like editing out all the uhs and ums. Because you're right, like that to me when I hear a, a podcast where there's no hesitation, there's no thought process when someone's trying to think. Uh, something that's on the tip of their tongue or whatever it does. It just sounds like a scripted conversation versus what I, I have a hard time calling this a long form interview show because I don't, I'm not a great interviewer, but I'm a, I, I love to talk and I can have, a, I, I think I'm a great conversationalist uh, and I try to, to market this as a long form conversation versus interview. Um, but so, but you do a lot of research. So that's where we differ. Uh, Cause I like to, for me, having that research, and, and um, I don't know how it is for you, uh, that means I'm going to have a list of questions. And, and then that list of questions for me, and that's, this is my weakness as, as being an interviewer, it holds me back from having that natural conversation. So when you do, is that how you run your, your interviews? Do you have all your research and then a list of questions, and then you're just better, better at it than I am, so you can actually make it sound natural? Well, I mean, that's the, you're phrasing it that way, but in reality – you're just the better conversationalist um, and I'm the weaker conversationalist. I think uh, I, I want to get to the point where I can go without uh, a general outline because that's what I have right now. You know, if I have an interview, I'll have, you know, six or seven topics that I want to cover and, and maybe a, a question written down within that topic. Um, but I think I've, I have come, you know, a relatively long way since the start. Um, 
you know, what I do with research is I'll, I'll probably do an hour uh, of research. You know, half of that consists of finding their background uh, and what they're currently doing and really what I want to talk to them about. And then the other half an hour probably goes into to watching videos, past interviews, reading articles about them. So, so I don't ask the same questions they've been, they've already been asked. And so I can, mm-hmm. you know, get a sense of how they react to certain questions and, and what really, you know, what really interests them and, and makes them answer something passionately and enthusiastically uh, rather than just, you know, going, going through the motions. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I, I think where I really struggled in the beginning is I was a really poor listener and I was so focused on, asking my next question and getting to the next topic. And I really struggled with asking really good follow-up questions that weren't scripted um, or or sharing something from my own life or my own story that could add to the conversation. And I think, I I think I've grown in that sense. And I think my, my past, you know, several interviews have been much better uh, from that standpoint. Uh, And I, it's, it's, I want to get to the point where you are, where I want to have, I want to have, I want to do research and I want to have questions, but I don't want to have it be, scripted at all i just want to have a, a flowing conversation yeah and that's so I, I and i think the research uh is i see the merit in it and i see the good the, how it could be a good idea where you don't uh ask questions that have been asked before or or you don't you know you can find the good topics that you want to uh have your guests talk about but that's uh that's the laziness in me is I, i'm a lazy lazy podcaster and for me um, I, I, and I, I guarantee you if I did the research and, and started thinking about what I wanted to ask the people is I would revert back to how I, I interviewed people in the beginning where I did have a list of questions. And I was that guy that you mentioned when you first started, where I would have five questions. Like if I think we aired it on one of, I, I we did a, I did an episode called 10 years of podcasting or something like that last year. Uh, and I played the very first interview I ever did with this guy uh fat baby leg who did this song christopher columbus and he was like on some nbc show like so you want to be famous or something like that years and years and years ago and i literally if my question was like hey so how'd you get into the music business really great story could have asked several follow-up questions oh that's great here's question number two uh so that's where i think like my note like having notes it makes me uh the worst podcaster ever or at least interviewer uh and that and and it's also again lazy like for me like if i sat down and listened to um we'll use your show as as an example if i sat down and listened to philly famous uh i i don't know that i would have a great conversation because then i know a lot about your podcast already and whatnot but that's me and i i i think it's a fault i think i should do research i just am lazy i do i do um like that you've you've seen how far you come and see where you want to go how many episodes are you at right now uh around 55 i mean on my on you know on itunes and soundcloud it'll say like yeah. episode 20 something but that doesn't include all the plugins, which are essentially the same uh, thing, um, it just I just call them plugin editions, but they're really the same length and the same quality. So I really I've, I've published over fifty episodes. That's um, so, and and you're like right at the point where like unless you really just don't want to do it anymore, that's like you've hit all the goals that you need to hit to to be a successful podcaster. I think um, there's a, a cool statistic out there that. Like if you're a podcaster uh, and you decide or you decide to start a podcast and you, you record one, you post one uh, out of all those people that start a podcast, maybe 50 percent of them get to 10 episodes. And then from there, maybe 10 to 20 to percent of them or whatever, get to 50 episodes. And once you hit 50, like that's two years of podcasting. So you've done basically two years worth of podcasting in, in eight months. Uh, so like you're at the point where like, unless you really just say, Hey, you know what? This isn't for me anymore. Like you've, you've hit, I think all the successful benchmarks you need to hit, um, uh, to be, to, to be in it, I think. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I really enjoy it and I want to, I want to keep doing it and I did it through, you know, through school. So I don't really have any excuses for time because I was doing it with, you know, in school. And so I can, I think I can continue to do it, uh, through this summer, um, and I, I want to continue to, to get, to keep it, you know, like I said, get it better and better. Um, and you know, while I might not necessarily want to be, uh, a podcaster for the rest of my life, I'm going to, you know, drag this out to, to see where I can get it. 
Now, so what, what, um, since you're still in school, are you going to school for some sort of broadcasting and this is kind of helping you get there? Cause you mentioned the temple, um, TV show. So I assume that you're doing that not just for fun. I mean, obviously for fun as well, but I'm assuming it has something to do with what you want to do in the future. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, um, this is all really new to me because I just started this year and I'm actually a sociology major at, at school. Oh, okay. um, I had no idea this was the route I wanted to go until this past uh, fall. And, uh, you know, looking back, it probably would have been a good idea to be a communications or journalism or media major. But I really like the liberal arts because I think it teaches you to become a good a writer, a really uh, a mm-hmm. good critical thinker uh, and just a, a problem solver. And, and, and you understand culture, society, you know, societal issues. Um, so I think that's made me a better conversationalist, just being a liberal arts major and taking poli sci classes, philosophy classes. Um, no, but the TV show, it's actually funny. Uh, I was meeting with, a, I think, a guy, an advisor of mine at Temple, and we we're just trying to talk about, you know, summer internships, what, what career paths I could go down. And he just gave me the number of the guy from, from Temple TV, and I, I was going to meet with him to see how I could get involved. And about 10 minutes before the meeting, I had an idea to pitch a show, and I pitched it to him, and he said, that's what we do here. You know, I, I, I listen to your pitch and if I like it, we're going to run with it. I like it. We're going to shoot the pilot in October. And, th- and that's how it went. Um, but in terms of my long-term uh, future, you know, I, I'm undecided. That being said, <laughs> um, my dream job, what, what I've kind of told myself over the last couple of months is I would love to host my own late night TV show. And I think that's why this fall is going to be my first uh, kind of test to see if, if I'm, if I have any talent or skill in that area. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, when uh, I did one live show uh, during my initial run of podcasting, probably about, I think it will be in uh, in October, it will be 11 years since that first live show. Uh, And it was just us like kind of playing MC uh, to a bunch of bands and introducing the bands, doing some banter, doing some giveaways and whatnot. Um, so when the opportunity came to do the uh, Philadelphia Podcast Fest, it was the first live show at that point that I had done in like nine years or something like that or eight years. Uh, and I was I was talking to my buddy. I was like, I don't I can't go up there for an hour with me and someone else and just have a conversation like that's that's dull. Like, I, I don't think that's going to, to work. So how do we shape this show? Like, how do I become a better on stage performer to make that good? And like, one of the things I did was like, well, I need a sidekick. Like, I need someone to, to banter with. Otherwise, I'm going to be awful. Um, and I was like, well, what do we do? What format do we take? And uh, I still have yet to perfect the, the, the format, but that's, I still kind of, uh, in my 30s, I'm probably in my career for life. But uh, one of the things that I've always kind of had, a, a, I've been a fan of. And then when I started Everything is Awesome, kind of wanted to see if I could explore in some fashion was late night TV as well. Um, and that's what we do. Uh, like, and uh, so I want to get to your live format and, and see, maybe we're on the same page here, but uh, I like our live shows, we do a lot of different formats, but our late night format is, is two guests, like a comedian uh, to, to end the show and a, and a regular guest to, to have the main conversation with. And then we have the, like, the monologue and the banter and whatnot. What are you doing to, to switch up your show for the live format? Yeah, it's something that, I'm, that I've been thinking about and have to do some more thinking on. But I think right now, definitely want to incorporate the audience and audience mm-hmm. questions. And um, fingers crossed, I'm hoping that I can get a big enough guest where most of the audience knows this person and will be interested in asking questions. Yes. Um, but one, one thing I do um, on my podcast, right, you know, for every episode, I do a couple segments. One's called the Choice Challenge, where... Um, you know, I'll either name th- two things. They have to pick one or do a, a would you rather. I'll do a, you know, a top five, top three. Um, so I'm going to continue to do that for the live show. Um, but no, like I, I, you, you bring up a good point. It's something I have to think about, you know, what will translate from just the audio and, and what do I need to add or do differently? Um, mm-hmm. what do you, what, what do you do differently? So, so the, and, and this is, um, my general advice for doing a live show is just to go do one. I think if you're a podcaster, you, you have you have the natural talent to just get there and do whatever you think is good. But since we have a similar show, uh, like what I do differently uh, is 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 I literally translate it into a, a late night format. Like our, I used to call them everything is awesome late night when we would do our our live shows in that format. Um, and it's it's we start the show, I come out. 
you know, I usually do some weird entrance because I, I that's the wrestler in me from back in my wrestling days. And I come out and we do a quick little monologue. I go back and forth with my co-host. I try to play some sort of game, whether it's um, whether it's with the guest or with the crowd. I try to get the crowd involved, uh, but it's always hit or miss whether you're going to have a crowd there uh, with live podcasting. So you can't count on that necessarily. Uh, but then we do, we introduce our first guest, we sit down for X amount of time. And I think this is what I think is, is really helpful. And, and especially even if you're just going to have the one guest on, you should absolutely steal from me is, uh, I like to make sure that the guests I have on, they can have, they can do something that is going to interact with me, my co-host and possibly the crowd. So like our first live show is everything is awesome. We, um, we had this fitness guy on who was a personal trainer and whatnot. And he made us do push a push up contest. He, there was this ab roller thing that we did. He hooked us up to some machine to let us know what our body fat was so that we knew where, like where we had to get down to and whatnot. Um, and it was a lot of fun, especially like the crowd, like loved us. Uh, I'm not in shape. I'm, I'm a, I'm a couple pounds overweight and uh, doing push ups like, uh, I, I'm not great at, so it was fun for the audience to see something like that. And then, um, and so that's how we switch it up. It's, it's, I, I guess mainly audience interaction. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, something that, uh, is visual that couldn't be conveyed through audio. Yeah. And, and we still, um, like, and, and I don't know how, what you're planning to do with your li- like the recorded file of your, your live show, but I absolutely still air it. Um, as a regular podcast in my feed, uh, we, we, um, I, I will usually put a pre intro up to explain like what's going on. Uh, because obviously like that visual stuff does not translate well in podcast form, but usually, um, and this comes from like kind of a, as a, as a fan of podcasts and a lot of the podcasts I listen to that usually have live shows associated with it as well. Uh, and then just like over my years of doing live podcasting now, like, I think it can translate well enough. Like it's, yeah, I'm doing push ups, but like the audience is reacting in the crowd. So I think the, the listening audience kind of has an idea. Um, and it's not taking up more than maybe five minutes and that's long uh, of, of the audio format. So really you're just asking your, your normal audience to like hang in there for a few minutes while you do something for the live audience. And then, then you're back at it where, where the, the audio uh, audience is getting the same uh, respect as the live audience. No. And I think, um, I think who does someone who does that better than anybody is probably Jimmy uh, Fallon. Uh, oh yeah. The way he can, he can kind of, you know, take over the audience and, and, and do something that where they're captivated and also laughing um, and incorporates the guest. I think, I think he does a great job of that. So let's get into let's get into a little bit of late night uh, because I, there's definitely a generational gap here. Who's your late night guy? Like who's the guy you you grew up watching and and uh, and continue to watch, or do you now like look at someone else as your your big influence in late night? Well, I mean, I did I didn't really grow up watching late night TV too much. Um, most of my late night TV was dedicated to a uh, you know late night NBA games or something. <laughs> okay okay so uh so, so now you know I, I'll, a little bit of everybody a little bit of fallon a little bit of kimmel uh I'm, i really like james corden um i think seth myers is getting better uh but i i think i think fallon is probably my favorite and um i mean they all have great guests it, so much of the show depends on who the guest is uh yes and, and how you know enthusiastic they are to be there um how just how into it they are um but i think Fallon does the best job of. Uh, I, I, it feels like the celebrity that's on connects with Fallon the most out of any of the of the hosts. Yeah, I. I uh, so I grew up as a as a Conan guy. Like I would, and I'm not like a late night. Say, like I grew up, like I watched it as a, as a teenager and, and all throughout like my, you know, pre high school, I guess that's middle school, but like, like middle school and high school years, I, I love to watch it. Like I would try to like, at least on like the weekend, like Friday night, I would be like allowed to actually do it, uh, when I was younger and, and had a curfew. But, uh, I always kind of like gravitated towards Conan, like Conan O'Brien was, and I think again, that's probably more true of my generation than than any other generation. Um, he was like the Jimmy Fallon uh, of my generation, uh, and it was it did that late uh, the late night show mm-hmm. uh, after the night show and whatnot. Um, and uh, but Fallon was like is 
to me, like he is like the current guy. I, I don't watch Conan anymore. I don't really watch much late night anymore because uh, I, I'm usually busy creating. So I don't I don't leave much time for myself to actually consume anything. And when I do, it's usually consuming other podcasts. Um, but uh, yeah, Fallon, I like I, I think if if we were to like disclude Conan simply because like he's I know he's still doing it and he's on TBS, but he's not really part of that. I don't feel like he's part of the 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 talk the talk show circuit anymore really only because it's it's just not on the big three channels or whatever you know um and and out of the big guys that are out there still it's i i feel like i feel like there's i guess if you're more political like colbert is your guy but fallon seems like you said the most relatable almost and for me i think he does while i agree like the guests absolutely have like everything to do with who I'm going to watch at any given night. Um, Fallon is the guy who like, I want to watch when there's no guests, like when it's the monologue, I want to watch Fallon when there's a game, I want to watch Fallon, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's a, he's a great, like, and, and I don't know if you, what did you watch it when he first started on? Uh, I don't know. I don't think it was late night. Cause I don't think I, when he was on after Conan, when Conan took over the tonight show, I didn't really watch him much every now and then. But when he first took over the Tonight Show, what were your thoughts? I mean, I don't, I don't even think I watched him at the start. Um, I would say it's only over the last two years or so that I got into. Okay. Him. So I kind of I've seen him as like a seasoned vet. So I didn't yeah. see him uh, in his rookie days. Yeah, it's. I remember the like, what, I don't, and I don't know if it was his. It may have been his late night show that was the the, the one that made me cringe. But like. The thing that Jimmy Fallon has, uh, if you know anything about him and like his his SNL days, is like he's the guy that cracks a smile, like does everything that Lauren Michaels hates when it comes to sketches. But I, that's why everyone loved Jimmy Fallon because like he he would break character and and kind of like going back to what we said about podcasting, like that's makes it more real and yeah, he, and it, your audience can relate. He's he's really comfortable in his own skin, which which makes him really likable. Yeah, uh, I know. I would. I would love to hear him on a podcast. All those late night guys, because I think they're all, um, in some ways, comedic geniuses. And th- because they're on mainstream TV, they have to be somewhat censored. So I, yeah. I would love to hear them go all out, uh, like on a podcast. Yeah, yeah, and I and I think we we saw something close to that with like. Well, and I guess Colbert was more like in character when he did the Colbert rapport, but I think you sat, you saw something like that a little bit more uh, of an untethered Colbert when he was on uh, comedy central. Um, and, uh, I, I think, I don't know about, I, I, I don't know. It's hard to picture, uh, Fallon and even Kimmel doing, um, anything else than they do. And I'm, I don't watch Kimmel often, so I really, I, I can't speak to, you know much about him but Fallon I feel like I I, I don't want to say I know him but I, I feel like I, I know like based off of what he's done in the past and, and 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 now I don't know I feel like he's he's the guy like I think you, you're gonna get and like the uncensored Jimmy is I feel like that guy <laughs> like I don't I don't know if he does hides much of himself absolutely uh I, and I'll tell you brought up James Corden um and and I've only watched a handful of his shows uh, but everyone that I watched, I really, really loved. And he does a great, like t- what I thought. And ma- I don't know. You can, uh, do you watch him often? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say often. I, I would say every couple of weeks, but then, you know, I'll go on YouTube and watch his carpool karaoke's and some yeah. of his segments. And, you know, he, he gets the, he gets his guests to loosen up a lot. I, like I remember he had Steph Curry on, uh, who, who's my favorite basketball player. And, uh, you know, he was singing Moana in the car and I think um, Frozen and, you know, they were having a blast. Uh, he, he looks like a type of guy you want to be friends with. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I like is and I, I assume he still does it. He breaks that normal late night mold of having one guest out at a time or sometimes the second guest, the first guest will stay when the second guest comes out. But the episodes that I watched, he just brought both guests out at the same time. Um, and just it was more of a group conversation uh, than a straight on interview. And maybe he's changed back to a f- traditional format. But I really that's what I, I like when because because late night has this this problem of kind of being stuck in its ways. And, and it sounds like Conan over at TBS is trying to do something different by switching to a half hour format um, and uh, next year. And 
uh, what I see it's, 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 I guess rare to see something new in late night because it's been around forever and how, you know, how many different variations can you do? And so it's refreshing to see something new like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and so, so with your interest in doing late night, like, is that what you like? And if kind of doing this live show where it's going to help you kind of maybe shape or practice for your temple show, which is also going to kind of help and shape, you know, maybe practice for doing some sort of late night thing. Do you think about that? Like, do you, do you, when you watch these bits, whether they're on YouTube or you watch the whole show on, uh, on, on TV, do you think about like, all right, how can I do this? and and be different yeah and I, and I think about that a lot in, in everything that i do um i, I don't i don't want to be the same as, as other people so i don't like to say oh i want to be the next jimmy fallon because i, I want to be my own thing um but no i mean i i haven't i haven't thought about you know the, the, the specifics of that but i think what's really important and that i've known and that i do want to emulate from all the hosts that i that i do see on late night tv is it feels like they're really respected by their celebrity guests and it, mm-hmm. they don't come off as fake. It's very genuine, which is what's great about late night TV. And even, even the guests seem to be more genuine on late night TV than they do on daytime interviews. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's important to, um, and what I, what I try to do in everything that I do in life is, is, is be my 100% self. Um, uh, I think, um, you know, people have, have a lot of issues with some things that I do, but I, I think the main compliment that I get from, from friends of mine, from, from guests on my podcast, uh, is that I'm pretty genuine and, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm an open book. There's, there's not much that, that I won't tell you. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try to do something behind your back. Um, and that's tr- kind of the, the way I try to go about my life. Um, I feel like if you're living either a lie or, or you're living, uh, you know, not the whole truth, um, you know, what's the point? Uh, yeah, no, and, that's and that I, makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I went on a tangent there, but I feel like that relates to to being a quality TV person because so yeah. many people in Hollywood on TV um, are fake. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think I want to be different, but I, I want to be real. And I think late night TV already does a good job of that. Well, I mean, and generally speaking, like, I mean, it's Hollywood's job to be fake, you know? So like when, when that's the expectation or, or at least the perceived expectation, um, from, from outside of Hollywood, when you get someone that is at least seemingly genuine and being real and whatnot, like, like I said, I feel like, I, I feel like Jimmy Fallon, I don't, I think the uncensored version of Jimmy Fallon is, is no different than what you see on late night. Um, and I think that makes, that's probably why he connects with the audience and why he was way successful, uh, and has been successful with the tonight show. And it's something that, you know, kind of, and again, it kind of goes back to what we said earlier with, you know, uh, just being, having a real conversation and leaving in the imperfections instead of editing it all out. Like it just, it, it, um, you know, someone I talked to recently had a great example of, um, a podcast that seemed real. And then the second season of it wasn't as popular because it was more polished. And that was Serial. I don't know. Did you ever listen to Serial? You know, sparingly. I feel like as, as a podcaster, I should because I've heard really good things. See, I, I, and as a, uh, as, as a seasoned podcaster, I would say definitely listen to season one of, um, of Serial and then listen to a couple episodes of season two. And you'll see like the difference in quality where, you know, they there's it's it's the focus isn't on the host in season two. So you don't get those conversations of like, oh, my God, this just happened while we like we recorded all these interviews months and months ago. But while I was doing follow up research and we were in the middle of production and and posting these, something came up. So let me call in while I'm on the road. Uh, And that's what Sarah did. And, And the first season, you have plenty of like. Uh, interludes of of especially like in the later episodes where she happens to be in somewhere and something about the case breaks mm-hmm. and she calls in and and it's it sounds like a phone recording um and so it's not the best quality and and uh to me that's why uh, it was such a good season and then if you go to season two there's a lot less of that a lot less of the actual host and a lot more of the interviews and, and, and the people from that related case talking versus the host and, and it takes it away. No, for sure. Um, and I think, and, and I think as a podcaster, like, you, you know, I, I, I didn't, 
I didn't realize that until the 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 person that told me this um, until she told me uh, like that's why she thought that it did not um, season two didn't succeed and I, and it it I I learned something without realizing I learned something uh, until you know just the other night so I think as a podcaster like you can learn a lot from listening to the I, and hey season one is just a good it's a good story so so I think you'd enjoy it if especially if you're kind of into like true crime at, at all um it's 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 a good first season of anything really um but it's also I think a good learning experience for podcasters no on my on my next uh 30 plus minute car ride I'll start it for sure uh so that being said uh what do you like hope to do with the podcast in the future we'll kind of wrap up on this note before my laptop battery dies um you know you're doing the live show uh i'm sure a lot of it hinges on how that does but are you looking forward to do doing more live shows is there something that you want to do with the podcast that you haven't done yet that that you're hoping to do a couple of things i want to do and change um you know, first, you know, this is my first live show and I just happened to you know, be scrolling through the Philadelphia um, podcast Facebook page where I came up on, on the podcast festival and, you know, submitted an application for it. Um, so I want to do, you know, more live shows if I can. I just have to, uh, you know, find uh, find the venues. Mm-hmm. Um, but beyond that, I want to maybe limit or, or, or lessen the frequency that I that I publish a podcast and make the ones that I do a, a higher quality. Um, I think some of the guests that I've had on um, haven't been great uh, conversationalists. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and some of them just are, aren't, you know, m- my audience doesn't really connect with them at all. Yeah. Um, so I want to get um, some bigger guests, some, some more interesting guests. Um and maybe do one a week, two a week, and and may, maybe not three a week like like I've done in the past. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. And, and since the summer started, I've I've really backed off. Just I've I've been I've been doing a couple other things, so I haven't um, been in my studio at all. Um, but no, I, I want to um, long term. What I would love to do is is approach a podcast network like The Ringer and say, listen, I think this is scalable and replicable. And I want the Philly famous podcast to become a city famous podcast and have basically a city famous podcast in every major city in the U.S. So have a New York famous podcast, an L.A. famous podcast, a Chicago famous podcast um, and and have it be under a larger podcast network. I don't think um, anybody has done this yet, um, really localizing the podcast, but on on a national scale. No. Uh, Yeah, that sounds unique to cater to you know the individual cities that being said i don't know if there's other cities that are as passionate about the people in their city as philly is which is what makes my podcast work yeah uh, people are proud to be from philly and they want to represent philly and i think there's there's only a few other cities in the u.s that are like that yeah uh, and, and i agree i've had this conversation with people who are in other cities like that and i've said that like i personally feel that philadelphia is especially when it comes to podcasting um is the premier city uh I, we have such a, we have a i think the largest podcast festival out of every podcast festival that i've ever found um out there we have uh, a tight knit group like my even though i've been doing this for for 11 years i felt i thought that the podcasting community was really cynical for the first uh eight years of it um and then when i found the philadelphia podcast society and um when i started this show like i saw how loving the community was and i and, and and it does go beyond philly like the podcasting community is in general a loving community um but but it all kickstarted with for me with, with the podcast society here in Philadelphia. Uh, and I don't, I don't think you have a better group. Um, it's, it's all really supportive. I, I guarantee you, I, we don't talk a lot about, um, anything but self-promotion in that group really. But when people do have questions, like everyone's willing to help, everyone's willing to help each other out. And, um, same thing. I mean, I, I, I this might be tuning my own horn, but like, I, 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 I bust my ass trying to help promote this festival by talking to, as many of the 45 shows as I can. And, and, you know, maybe only 10% of them or or 20% of them or whatever respond to me. But like, that's, I think huge, uh, to that, that anyone is like saying, Hey, let's go out there and just do, 
you know, if I'm posting an episode, uh, an episode a day for the next month, because I have 45 people getting back to me to, to do interviews and I'm doing 45 interviews. Okay. I'm going to do it because it's going to help make the festival better, hopefully. Um, and I, I don't, I, I personally don't feel like any other city is like that. Uh, but I've talked to people from Chicago and they're like, no, 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 we are the podcasting capital of the world. So I think your idea works. I think you could find cities like Chicago and New York and, and Boston and, and, uh, maybe LA, I don't know, but like other cities, you can find other cities and maybe you don't get 50 versions of that for one for every state. But, um, I think you could, and I think I would, uh, of course it would be more work on your end, but I think the challenge is to not necessarily find another network to, to do it for you, but to, to start your own network, uh, and do it yourself. No, yeah, that, that'd be bold. And it's something that I would definitely um, you know, want to do. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, so I, I have a, a small podcast network, uh, and it's, uh, it's not fun to do uh, at all. Uh, but, um, it, it's, it's, it, it's neat. And I, and I enjoy having other shows that are just kind of under our brand of entertainment and whatnot. And, um, but I, 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 and as someone who like, I love your idea and I would happily, uh, uh, not that we're, like, I know you're looking for a major network, so, so we want to be the ones to do it for you. But like, I would happily like have that idea on our network. It makes so much sense, but I, I think like the way you truly win at that, and, and maybe you start out on a, on a smaller scale with, with by being part of another network. But I think you do it on your own, and that's how like you kind of reap all the benefits of that. Yeah, for sure. And I think uh, you know this this is looking relatively into the future. I, I think I think right now I I, I want to keep making my own yes. podcast as good as it can be, um, and you know. You look at the best podcasts; they are constantly adapting, constantly changing, uh, and in and, and any industry, but particularly this one, you can't be stuck in in in, in the past. You have to keep evolving. Yes, uh, I and, and I don't know what your plan is, um, but like I I'm a, I'm a weekly show, so so I'm uh, maybe sometimes I'll put out a couple specials here and there, but I don't usually record more than fifty five to sixty episodes in a year, and it's usually it's usually closer to 52, 55. I do one a week. Sometimes I'll do a couple specials, so I might get up to 55 or so. Um, but I, a, I try to take those specials as opportunities to do something new. And then every year, the challenge to myself is to switch my show up a little bit. Um, so like the first year I had a lot of two parter episodes. Second year I said no more two parters. I tried to keep it under an hour or it's just going to be an hour and a half, two hour episode, whatever. And then year three, I decided to get rid of doing the intros, I think, you know, we mentioned it in the beginning of the show where I used to start a show out with my guests, explain what was going to go on and say, all right, here we go. Welcome to this week's edition of Everything is Awesome, blah, 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 blah. And I, w- I would do my intro live with the guest. Uh, I got rid of that because every episode I do a pre-intro anyway. So why have two intros at that point? Um, but yeah, I think like my my challenge to myself is every every year I after my anniversary show is I, I try to um, not necessarily adapt, but I, I change things up to make things more interesting for myself and my audience that's that's a great idea so uh all right it, well it is uh it's been just about an hour uh and my laptop is very close to dying so i don't want this to cut off on you so let's get uh so all your plugs out where people can find you your show and of course uh the the philadelphia podcast best show awesome thank you so much so uh I'll start with Instagram. I'm at uh, at Philly Famous Podcast on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at at Philly Famous Pod. I haven't really built out the Twitter yet, but it, it's gonna, you know, I'm gonna start doing more work there. Um, I have a website, phillyfamouspodcast.net, um, which has all my episodes, couple couple YouTube videos that I have, uh, and and all the li- the list of my guests and the categories they're in. Um, so that that's my that's my social media. Once again. Podcast Festival, Sunday, July 1st, 3 p.m. at the Tattooed Mom Bar on South Street. Um, uh, that's it for me. Uh, Kevin, I want to thank you so much for uh, for having me on, and we definitely have to figure out a time for, for you to come on, Philly. For Fame. sure. Uh, I uh, The only thing I like more than being lazy on my show is uh, having to do even less preparation by being a guest on other shows. So uh, I would happily be a guest on your show anytime. Uh, and again, thank you for taking time out of your day, uh, and, and doing the show, uh, really great conversation and, um, I just, uh, yeah, podcast festival, be there. If you're going to be there any day, I feel like it's the first because I'm there. 
Greg's there. I know Full Bay. Like the lineup on the first is a pretty damn good lineup. I don't know if you're familiar with any of the shows, but you're that that lineup is a pretty special lineup. I really dig it. So come out to Tattooed Moms on the first. I kick things off at 1 p.m. and then there's just shows after shows that are so great, including Greg's Philly Famous with an F. Philly with a PH, famous with an F. That's a key thing to remember. Everything is awesome. Thank you to Greg for being on the show. Lovely conversation. Um, we weren't able to, because I forgot to respond, uh, schedule a time for me to be on his show prior to the festival. Um, however, I believe next week, um, post-festival, I will be a guest on the show, and, and I'm, I'm not sure when it's going to air, but uh, pretty excited. I haven't been a guest on someone's show in a while, so I'm pretty excited to, to get in the, the guest chair where there's even less responsibility for me. I just got to show up and like answer questions and whatnot. That's awesome. So make sure you check out Philly Famous. Uh, all the links to the show and Greg are in the, in the show notes here. Uh, and if you can make it out to Tattooed Moms on July 1st, uh, do so to check out Greg's show, Philly Famous, at 3 p.m. Come a couple hours early and get some free funny from Everything is Awesome. We'll be on at 1 p.m. giving out prizes with our challenge game, Food Fright. We'll have awesome guests in Jacqueline Holloway and Kyle Harris. And, of course, Full Belly Laughs is on at 2 p.m. as a very delicious dessert to Everything is Awesome. Uh, it's going to be a fun time. Come check out the festival, phillypodfest.com slash schedule for the complete schedule because there's also amazing shows happening on the 30th like Doom Thugs and uh, the ghouls next door who we'll be talking to next uh, time. So check all those shows all weekend long. Hey, you know what? You guys are awesome. I love the fact that you spend time with me, and especially in June or July, whenever the Philadelphia Podcast Fest happens, we usually go into overdrive, and we, we kick out a lot more interviews and shows. So the fact that you have been listening to these episodes uh, almost daily um, it means a lot to me and the guests who take their time to be on the show. I know you could be doing literally anything else, but you're with us uh, or we're with you during your car uh, drive to work or while you're working or wherever it is you're listening to us. Thank you so much for letting us invade your ear holes for this time. Um, that support means the world to me. However, I'm going to ask for a little bit more. You take you guys take from me. You guys take all this free funny. And I'm asking for just a little bit more support. Uh, I'm joking, of course. I appreciate all the, all, all the time you, you spend listening to us. But if you are able and willing to support more, there's a few ways you can do that. Five-star rating and reviews on iTunes is definitely one of the most helpful things you can do because Apple's math, when there's more five-star rating and reviews, help get us... Um, in front of more listeners. And the more listeners that are listening to us, the, the, the cooler things that we can do, like live shows and panels and Comic-Cons and stuff like that. Uh, you can also, word of mouth recommendations uh, is, is arguably even bigger. Uh, us, you physically telling someone to listen to this show um, will help more people listen to the show and retain them listening to the show. And of course, if you're able to afford a subscription on patreon.com slash that entertains, where you can subscribe to not just everything is awesome, but the entire that's entertainment podcast network and the that's entertainment brand where we have reviews, videos, uh, and, uh, and podcasts available for early access. We have exclusive content and stuff like that. So thank you so much for subscribing there. Uh, uh, that's all. That's all I got for you. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time right here on awesomepodcast.com. We are part of the Court Temp Arts Podcast Network on CourtTempArts.com. We've been awesome. Thank you for listening to the Court Temp Arts Podcast Network. To listen to more Court Temp Arts shows, visit CourtTempArts.com.